live. He didn't have long. So they set out. And I was so privileged, and then I do say privileged. I'm not saying this thinking I'm somebody. I'm nothing but old sinner saved by grace. Amen. But he contacted me and said, Would you and one other guy represent the state of South Carolina? And would you come? We're going to have this big thing for Curtis before he gets so bad that he won't be able to come. Well, the headquarters for the sword of the Lord was in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So we took off and went to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That night, there was a great crowd gathered there. When they brought Curtis in, he was, see the last time I'd seen him, he was tall and shoulders back. Man, just seemed like God all over him had a picture of hell. They brought him in and he was like this. Just could barely get in. Well, they didn't have a high podium. They just had something with one step. Curtis got up there and he said, I thank you for coming, but I don't want anybody to pity me. He said, I want you to know that I'm on the winning side. Well, that man who could barely talk to start with, that man whose voice was so low, that body that was so bent over in pain and agony, all of a sudden, it was like a cloud came from another world and rested on him. All of a sudden, he stood up real straight and he started singing as good as our choir. One man, he started singing, I'm on the winning side. Lord, have mercy. You talking about that place coming unglued? And from that day to this, every time I get down, every time I get discouraged, every time the devil tries to jerk my chain, I realize. It doesn't matter what happens down here. I'm on the winning side. I belong to him. And he belongs to me. Would you say amen? And learn how to worship. Amen. Curtis was sick and eaten up with cancer. But that boy worshiped. He wasn't a boy. That man, he worshiped to that night. A bunch of other people worshiped with him. Some people don't even know what I'm talking about. They go to church, you sing a song, you sit down. You stand up, you sit down. They take off, the they do this, they do that. And then the last thing that's connected with a closing amen is Cracker Barrel. Yeah. Such a religious ritual. I'm talking about tonight, worship. In spite of your troubles... By the way, Curtis didn't live but three more weeks. And over his grave, they built a tall monument about this tall. Built kind of like the Washington Monument. And it's got the plan of salvation on his headstone. Anybody that goes to that cemetery gets witness to. Somebody give me an amen. My favorite headstone was when a fellow by the name of Solomon Pease died. It says on his headstone, this is not Pease, it's only his pod. Pease shelled out and went home to God. Somebody give me an amen. I'm told about tonight knowing the reality of a God that's alive even when you're rock bottom, even when you're in the valley and when things are on you like this sister tried to sing tonight like the Dunmore, your family back here. Not a pleasant evening for them with Bob service tomorrow. But mister, when you can forget about what's bugging you, what's problem and you can just get touch, uh, in touch with God and make that connection and the power begins to flow then you forget who's there and it's just you and God Amen. then you can say you have worshipped quickly I gotta hurry let me give you a few points we should worship number one because of who he is we should worship not listen not because of right now what all he's done for me we need to worship Him because of who He is. There are three things about Him. Look in verse 3 with me, uh, please. Uh, in Psalm 95, verse 3 says, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all 
little gods. There are three things about God that lets us know how awesome that He is. And how majestic and how wonderful that God is. Three things. Let me give them to you and preach on all three of them just real quickly. First of all, I want to submit to you tonight, He's so awesome, He created this world at the command of His voice. He said on one occasion, let there be light. And before he pronounced the T on the end of the word light, the sun was already hanging in the sky, shining in all of its glory. At the spoken command of God. He made this world. He made everything in it. Uh, there's not that. Listen, folks, the stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, the planets, the flowers, the grass, the oceans, the mountains, none of that would be here if it had not been for the creating power of God. So for that one thing alone makes Him worthy of worship. Now we think it's a great big thing. Look, Listen to me tonight. I'm trying to hurry. If you own a hundred acres, let's say, man, you'd think you'd be somebody. You'd probably be strutting around, <laughs> pulling your suspenders out because you're 100 acres. Let me tell you something. 100 acres on a world map wouldn't even be a dot. Right. Amen. If somebody owned the entire state of South Carolina, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Savannah River, from North Carolina down to about Savannah, everybody would say, Lord, have mercy. What a massive fortune and a massive individual. But what if somebody owned from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific? Amen. That's unfathomable, fathomable, uh, the, the uh, uh, worth and the fortune of that. What if somebody owned North America from Canada to uh, our country to Mexico on down to South America? Unbelievable. But what about if somebody owned all of Europe from London to Amsterdam, on to Berlin, on across to Rome, on across to Jerusalem, and on up to the Ukraine, and all the way through the former Soviet Union, all the way to China, and all around. You'd say it's mine. Well, let me tell you, every bit of that came into existence because that God that I have the privilege of and being connected to, He had that power that He created all of that at His spoken command. And just the fact that a mere sinner like a Myself can come into his presence. Honey, listen, that's enough to make me want to worship. First of all, we worship him because of who he is. First, he's creator. But I want you to notice another thing he said in that verse. It says something about our maker. Now, that's two different things. In the Hebrew, it's the, the word creator and the word maker is not the same. Like in English, it's two things, but most people think it's the same. When he talked about the creator, that means he created the universe. But when he says maker, he's talking about when he made you. And he made you and you and you. See, you wouldn't even have an existence. You wouldn't have a life had it not been for him. So you're talking about somebody to worship. I'm not going to worship some fella running around with a helmet on and some shoulder pads when I got an opportunity to come worship uh, the great creator of the universe and the maker that gave me life to start with. But wait a minute, I'm not finished yet. We should worship him because of who he is. He's creator and he's maker. But for those of us that know him personally, he's savior. He poured himself into flesh. I believe that God, the Lord Jesus existed eternally long before Bethlehem's manger. I believe that he existed with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But he laid aside everything he had, poured himself into human flesh, came to this world, and died, and born in Bethlehem, went to Calvary, and died for our sin, but glory be to God. He did not stay dead, but he rose from the dead, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And you going to worship somebody else? Catch his pass. I'm 
glad I worship one better than I don't even know those quarterbacks' names. Does it matter? And then, like you say, it really doesn't even matter anyway. As long as I know his name. First of all, I got to hurry. Number one, we ought to worship him because of who he is. Number two, we need to worship him because of what he became. Now this might sound like to you a play on words, but it's not. But let me build up to it. What did he become? Well, let me say, he laid aside the throne in heaven for you. He laid aside, he took his crown off and laid it aside for you. He gave up the angel praises and he did it for you. Our Bible says, and I quote, he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He gave up all of the riches of heaven to come here. Then once he was born, he suffered. He lived. I said on one occasion, the foxes have their holes and the fowl of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. And he suffered in all the things that went. But on top of that, he went to the cross. But all that's good, but I haven't told you yet what he became. The Bible said, he that knew no sin became sin. Let me tell you, the Holy Son of God, that had never had one wrong thought. Never had anything in his mind wrong in any way. When he goes to the cross of Calvary, listen, they got him nailed on that cross, one hand that way, the other hand that way. I believe that's symbolic. I believe there at Calvary, Miss Williamson, I believe with one hand that way, he reached back into the past. Uh, every sin had ever been committed from Adam and Eve's day all the way through the Old Testament to that day at Calvary. But with that other hand nailed the other way, I believe he he reached ahead in time and he saw you and he saw you and he saw you and he saw me and I'm glad that I report to you he rolled that sin on himself. He became sin. And when he died, I'm glad that I can tell you, my sin died with him there at Calvary. They took him and they buried him in that tomb. But three days later, hallelujah to God, he walked out of that tomb alive forevermore. But our sin never did resurrect. Our sins are still dead in that grave. Somebody say amen. Are you going to worship a football team? Thank you, Jesus. need to worship Him because of who He is. Secondly, we need to worship Him for what He became. Number three, we need to worship Him for what He has done. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. And because he rose from the dead, tomorrow when we have this service, I can tell the Dunmoyer family, Brother Bob is more alive right now than he ever was. Well, that's what I told Gwen out there at the bedside at the hospice yesterday. I said, we know he had just left us just within moments. And I got there and I said, Sister, I want to say that I'm sorry. And for you, I am. But for him, why should we be sorry? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And listen, he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. And the death and the grave has no more dominion over those that are born again. And hey, listen, he had eternal and everlasting life. So listen, I'm here to tell you right now, if you ever get the word some future day that some brother or some sister has died, that's worship God with you. Don't you believe one word of it. They'll be swinging around the pillars of pearl. Shouting the victory in the glory world. Man, we need to worship Him. For who He is. For what He became. And what He's done. Miss Williamson, I'm going to use her as an example. She went in the hospital the other day. The family was kind of rattled. And uh, they said there's something wrong with her heart. And 
they gonna take her up and they gonna do something to her heart. Didn't know whether it'd be bypass or stent. They gonna have to do something to her heart. I met them in the little room up there, and we all had prayer. And I had to leave to go to the hospice with the Dunmoyers. And I found out a little bit later they took her back and they came out and said, "We we don't know what's happened here, but there there's no blockage." There's nothing there for us to stint. There's, am I telling the truth, man? There's nothing there to stint. There's nothing there to bypass. Why, that woman's healthy and fine, amen. But these other doctors saw with their own eyes that there was a blockage. Let me tell you what. I want to worship him tonight because of what he has done. When I get rock bottom, when I get sad, and I do once in a blue moon about every 40 years, I might get down a little bit. No, I'm human too, but when you get down, I'm glad that he's got a way of coming to you and lifting you back up. Hey, listen, folks, all the money in the world cannot buy you peace, cannot buy you happiness, and cannot buy you joy. And when you rock bottom, isn't it good to know that there's a God that cares about you and brings you up and brings you out of it and brings you back up on the mountain and changes these scenarios that did not look so good. Good. When it's his will, of course. Some people God heals and leaves them here. Some people he heals by taking them to heaven. But it's all his will. So first of all, we worship him because of who he is. Because of what he became and because of what he's done. Wait a minute, folks. If we had a testimony, if we had time tonight, I know you got to get home for half time. <laughs> or even before kickoff. <laughs> if we had time tonight for a testimony meeting, people all across this building, I know because many times I've been at that hospital with you. I've been at those funeral homes with you. And I've seen how low that many have been. But you'd have to pop up, you'd have to brag. Not on a medicine. It, listen, if it was the medicine that did it, then everybody that takes the medicine either get well or everybody that takes it would get worse. But why is it with some it's better and some it's not? Because it's not in the medicine, it's in God that does the work according to His will. But you could pop up tonight, Sister Juanita, I'm going to use her as illustration. I'm going to be honest, she's human. I know she had faith and sang the other week, talked about God, but she had to have that PET scan. What they had taken out did come back with some things about it that wasn't good. And they said, well, you know, we're going to have to do a PET scan. That scan from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet just to see if anything else shows up. Well, we prayed over her and held her up before God and she went up there and then found out there was nothing else there anyway, shape, form, or fashion. Hey, listen, if that's not reason to worship, if that's not reason to worship, I don't know what is, amen. Got another fellow sitting over here and I wouldn't embarrass him for anything in the world so I won't even call his name. But I'm going to tell you what, had to have valve replacement in his heart a while back. And stopped out here one day in front of the church, one day through the week, and he said, you know, if I have surgery and I get better, I'm going to be better. If I have surgery and it don't work out, I'm still going to be better. Amen. Man, that's what you call faith. But when God brings you through these things and it still turns out to be in your favor and God to bless you, who in the world are we to sit back like a bunch of knots on a fossilized law and won't give Him praise and will not worship the God that's been so good to us? And all across the building, everybody can brag on God. That's right. He's blessed you, but wait a minute. We hadn't got to the real stuff yet. He saved you. You got a mansion in heaven. You missed out on hell. You're going to meet the Lord face to face one day. You're going to meet those mamas, those daddies. Sadly, those children that's had to go before some people. Those brothers, those sisters. Our family in Christ, one by one, has gone on to the other side. And we're going to get to see them one day. Now, wait a minute. 
When you've not seen somebody in a while, and then you get to see them again. <laughs> now, if you moved off or somebody in the family moved off and you haven't seen them for six months or a year or whatever it is, and man, you get to see them again, man, people just come unglued. Let me tell you this very quickly. I've told it before and I promise I'll tighten things up. <laughs> I was preaching in Detroit, Michigan. Well, actually Jackson, Michigan. But I flew out of Detroit back here. And I was on the plane with this fellow. And I knew he was in the military. He had on his uniform and all. But I didn't know anything about his history. I didn't know if he had just been somewhere stateside. We flew back in and... Man, we got there and we started coming off of that plane, coming down that escalator where all the people were. They're holding big signs. Welcome home. I found out later that old boy had been in Iraq or Afghanistan, maybe Afghanistan. And he'd been in war. He'd been in combat. All of a sudden, I was kind of behind him on that escalator coming down. Somebody hollered, there he is! Man, that crowd started shouting. They start having themselves a time. I didn't even know them. I just got in on it too. I don't know. I just got in. But I thought about something. Now it's bad to be in Iraq or Afghanistan or my generation, Vietnam, some others, Korea. But wait a minute. After the separation we've had for these years, when you go swinging through the gates of heaven and somebody starts shouting, there he is. Or there she is. You're going to be so ashamed that you didn't worship him if you allowed the church to be a ritual instead of worship. Oh, my goodness. And the last and final thing that I've got time for tonight, I not only am going to worship him because of who he is and what he became and what he's done, number four, I'm going to worship him now for what he's going to do later. I'm going to worship him in advance. See, he made a promise. And you know what? He's never broke one yet. He told the disciples one time, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So listen, he told us he's coming back for us. So I'm going to worship him now in anticipation of what we call the rapture. And then not only that, I'm going to worship him now because he's going to move us into a mansion. You know something? You're going to live in a mansion greater than what any one of these high dollar football players live in. You're going to live in something more high fashion and fancier than what any of the coaches or the team owners live in. The Bible says mansions. I reject these new versions of the Bible that said, in my father's house are many rooms. Honey, I'm not going to a board house on the other side of Mars. I'm going to a mansion with my name on it, on streets of gold with gates of pearl, and we're going to move in and have us a time in glory. Imagine when we get there. I don't know about you, but you know, I'm about three quarters crazy anyway. But I think a lot of times about wonder what it'd be like. You know, Sister Pat, I don't see tonight, but oh brother well, I mean the other Sister Pat Williams. We got Pat Drake here. But I'll just go ahead and use you. You're a pat. I imagine that when you go through the gate, sister, old brother Bob is going to run out to meet you. I can see right now in my mind's eye coming in that door over there with that walker and could barely get around. It would take y'all 30 minutes from the parking lot to his seat. But you know what? Bob Drake was determined he was going to be in the house of God and was as long as God left him here. The reason I mentioned the other, Sister Pat, I imagine when I swing through the gates, I'm going to hear somebody saying, true story. Y'all know what that is. Old Brother Bo, 
long as he lived, every time he got to telling you a story to emphasize it, he'd say, true story, true story. I imagine we'll hear him talk about that true story again. Brother Bob stood right at this, Bob Dunmoyer, at this pulpit, and bragged on how God had touched him and blessed him, and whatever happened, he was okay with it. We're going to hear that voice afresh and anew. And it won't be for a short period of time. It'll be for all of eternity future. If we could get all these things plugged into our minds, we wouldn't have a problem with our mind wandering and getting off on other things. We would experience true worship. I had something happen to me the other day, and I haven't even told my wife about this. But uh, I got an office, but I got more books and about as many as Anderson County Library. And I picked up a book that I hadn't looked at in years. And I flipped through that. There was a little envelope. Had my name on it. I looked at that and I recognized the handwriting. I picked it up and somehow or another I had never opened it. Evidently I'd gotten home one Christmas in a hurry and either doing things for my grandchildren or my children or whatever and I put it there and then it later got in a book maybe accidentally. I opened up. It was a card from my mom. And I'd never been in it before because if I had I would have taken the money out already. <laughs> I still had some money in that card that my mother, who's already been in heaven for a good several years, had given to me at Christmas. And you know what? It was kind of like she gave me something now. Touch my heart. But when I saw the handwriting, I knew who it was from. But one day it's going to be more than seeing the handwriting again. One day we're going to meet. We're going to have us a spell. Maybe we might shout for a thousand years before we even realize what we're doing. But I'm going to tell you what, heaven's real. I do not believe for one split second that the saints of God that have left one by one, I don't believe they're out there in some non-existent state. Our Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said in that verse, I still have my place and I don't, but he said let us come and worship. Let us bow down, he even says. Forget about your dignity. Forget about the fact that you might be a supervisor or a manager or an administrator. And apart from God, that we're nothing. And as good as he has been to us, God shame us if we can't worship the true and living God. Amen. Our Father, we bow in your presence tonight and I ask you, God, to take this message. And I pray that, God, that every one of us would question ourselves, not question the person around us, beside us, or in front of us, but question ourselves. Do I worship? Have I worshipped today? Not have I been in a worship 
service today, but how I worshiped today. Have I gotten so plugged into you, Lord, that I forgot where I was and I just got totally in tune with you? Help us, Lord, to experience real, true worship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In order to worship Him, you've got to know Him. Do you know tonight that you're born again? I'm going to ask many church officers that can and will get around the altar to pray. Then the altar's open for anybody else that might want to come for any business whatsoever. And of course, don't leave this building without knowing that you're saved.